Defending the Earth, a dialogue between Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman, published by South End Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1991. Chapter 2, Ecology and the Left. Paul McIsaac. Those of you who have been following and reading the Earth First Journal and Murray's writings, or who have attended a number of Green Conferences have understood that a strident, often harsh, debate has existed within the radical ecology movement for the past few years, a conflict in which both Murray and Dave have played a big part. It seems important to me that they're both here now on the same stage and that they have reached out to each other so strongly in their opening remarks. Perhaps now we can productively turn to a number of differences between them that have appeared in their previous talks and writings. Right now, I would choose just one difference to ask about their differing views about the role to be played in the ecology movement by what I call, for lack of a better term, the left. When I was out in Oregon, I had dinner one night with some Earth Firsters and this debate came up within that group. One of the women, Judy Berry, was from the East Coast originally and comes out of a leftist tradition. When she went out to California, and ultimately to Oregon, she got involved in Earth First. She is now a very active and successful Earth First organizer in that area. Interestingly what she's done with her left tradition is reach back to the tremendous history of the industrial workers of the world in the Northwest in order to understand what they did and how they worked, in order to see if their organizing holds any lessons for the radical ecology movement today. By looking at Earth First's organizing situation from a middle working class perspective, she has come to understand that, if we reduce our consumption of trees, if we stop the exporting of logs to Japan and other Pacific Rim countries, and if we stop the cutting of old growth, we will create the necessity for retraining workers and even a whole new kind of economy. According to Judy, this requires that Earth first. Really address the questions of worker control and creating a decentralized forestry industry that works in a harmonious way with nature. It means thinking about people's jobs and being sensitive to workers' fears. While listening to Judy, I noticed that another Earth First organizer at the table basically had, it seemed to me, a sort of fog that went over his eyes when the dialogue started. In the course of the conversation, it was clear that he didn't understand or want to deal with the left tradition of the Wobblies or feel comfortable with all this talk about the working class. For him, the loggers were immoral, anthropocentrics. They were just as much a part of the ecological problem as the logging companies. So I ask both of you, does the leftist tradition have anything to offer the radical ecology movement? I know that Dave Foreman has said that the tradition of the radical left is basically a language, a way of thinking, and a way of acting that should be abandoned in order for us to move ahead. Murray, on the other hand, represents the populist, libertarian wing within the left tradition. He calls himself an eco-anarchist. He draws extensively on the left tradition and encourages others to do so as well. Recently he helped found the Left Green Network to be a self-conscious leftist voice within the broader green movement. What do either of you have to say to this question? What is the value of the left tradition for the radical ecology movement? Dave Foreman Well, I have to admit that I come from a different tradition, a tradition that is actively hostile to the left. As I said, I started out campaigning for Barry Goldwater in 1964. This seemed pretty natural after growing up as an Air Force brat. I was also the New Mexico chair of Young Americans for Freedom during the 1960s. For what it's worth, however, I was in the anarchist faction of YAF. We hated William F. Buckley, that smarmy little twit. Even back then, even when I was a 19-year-old YAF punk on the University of New Mexico campus, I couldn't stand William F. Buckley. The guy just turned my stomach. Yet, at the time, I did buy into the big lie of the Cold War years that there was a global communist conspiracy out there that was threatening to destroy our freedom. The real appeal to me, though, was Goldwater's libertarian rhetoric. You would be surprised at the number of people I've known who worked for Goldwater as college students and have now become radicals. 
The Vietnam War started me questioning my beliefs but I had not become questioning enough before I graduated from college in 1968. At that time, you either joined the military or you were drafted. So, I joined the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School at Quantico. I was there at the same time Ollie North was. We never bumped into each other, however. I spent only 61 days in the Marine Corps. 31 days were in solitary confinement in the brig. The commandant of OCS at Quantico told me I was the worst officer candidate in Marine Corps history, which now seems like a pretty good compliment. The problem was that I found out very quick that there was nothing libertarian or Jeffersonian about the Marine Corps, or the people fighting the Vietnam War. After my discharge, I went back to New Mexico, to my father's great distress. He would have preferred I died in Vietnam rather than dishonor the family, though we have had a rapprochement since. I also became active with the anti-war movement at the University of New Mexico and made several speeches against CIA recruiting and the war. This was a fairly big coup for campus radicals, to have the former leading hawk on the UNM campus come back from the Marines and take the other side. Since then, I have been in a not always comfortable dance with the left. I share a number of commitments with the left, yet, I come at my politics from a somewhat different direction. For years, my primary political and philosophical tradition has been the U.S. conservation movement. My heroes are Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and Bob Marshall. For all the complaints about my ignorance about the left, a lot of leftists have never seriously grappled with the ideas of these people. Our traditions overlap, sure, but they are also different. I come from the wide open spaces of New Mexico. I haven't come from the urban centers of the East where the left tradition is so much stronger than in the Southwest. The left tradition is not something I understand that well. Leftists often talk a little different language than me. That doesn't mean we have to fight, it just means we start out emphasizing different things. I actually think we have a lot to learn from each other. I don't necessarily consider myself a leftist. I don't want to tar that movement with my association, for one thing. But I do have a great deal of sympathy for these movements and I continue to learn from my sometimes clumsy dance with the left. When we formed Earth First in 1980, we consciously tried to learn from the strategy and tactics of a number of left social movements. The Wobblies were certainly one group we were drawn to. I even published a little green song book, taking after the little red song book of the IWW. I've talked to Utah Phillips and some old Wobblies, I am really attracted to a lot of what they have to say. In a place like Oregon, where we are seeing huge multinational corporations essentially practicing a policy of cutting and leaving, a good dose of leftist, anti-capitalist analysis can help us understand the situation. These companies, in their obsession for profit, don't give a damn about community stability or employment. They plan to leave in 10 years after they have used up the Northwest forests. They have the capital to move somewhere where they can grow pine trees like corn in Iowa. I totally agree that we need to get the big money out of the forests and make room for small worker-owned operations. I made such a proposal for the Pacific Northwest four or five years ago. My proposal was to prohibit any logging in the national forests except by small locally owned companies, preferably worker owned companies. Furthermore, the plan would have required a certain number of jobs per million board feet both in the woods and in the mills. Right now we are cutting as much timber from the national forests as ever, but the employment, the number of people doing that, is about half of what it used to be. And the reason is automation, because the big companies can make more money that way. Right now we are cutting something like 11 to 12 billion board feet of timber from the national forests every year, but the large timber companies are sending something like 10 billion board feet of barely milled logs to Japan every year. In other words, nearly the entire output of the national forests is going unmilled, unprocessed to Japan. The companies are exporting jobs along with the trees. So, if you want to understand this situation, you need an analysis of multinational capitalism, an analysis of capital mobility and its effects on our communities. 
One of my biggest complaints about the workers up in the Pacific Northwest is that most of them aren't class conscious. That's a big problem. Too many workers blame environmentalists for costing them their jobs. But who is costing them their jobs? It's not the conservation movement to protect the old growth forest that is wiping out jobs in the Pacific Northwest, it's the greed of the multinationals. We could easily have more employment, more community stability in the Pacific Northwest without cutting any more old growth forest. But how do you get that across to a lot of workers who have bought into the mentality that the companies have put out for them, that the environmental movement is against them, and that if they're good, if they're obedient, if they resist us, everything will be fine. The history of the Wobblies and other left-wing union movements undoubtedly has a lot to teach us about organizing with workers. On the other hand, I have some big problems with how the left tends to romanticize workers and only see them as victims. The loggers are victims of an unjust economic system, yes, but that should not absolve them for everything they do. It does not follow from the huge guilt of the capitalists that all workers are blameless for the destruction of the natural world. I think we need to face the fact that industrial workers, by and large, share some of the blame for the Earth's ongoing destruction. I want workers to resist more, to become a lot more militant and not be such eager and willing slaves to the big companies or believe all of their propaganda all the time. Too many workers buy into the worldview of their masters that the earth is a smorgasbord of resources for the taking. Indeed, sometimes it is the hardy swain, the sturdy yeoman from the bumpkin proletariat so celebrated in wobbly lore who holds the most violent and destructive attitudes towards the natural world, and towards those who would defend it. I don't think it is wise to put the working class, or any oppressed group, on a pedestal and make them immune from questioning or criticism. My biggest problem with the left, of course is that it has so little appreciation for natural systems and for wilderness and wildlife. Our society our civilization, has no divine mandate or right to pave, conquer, control, develop, use or exploit every square inch of this planet. At best, the left, if it pays any attention to ecology at all, does so in order to protect a watershed for downstream use by agriculture, industry, and homes. It does so to provide a good place to clean the cobwebs out of our minds after a long week in the auto factory or over the VDT. It does so because it preserves resource extraction options for future generations of humans or because some unknown plant living in the wild may hold a cure for cancer. It does so because nature is instrumentally valuable to human beings. The vast majority of leftists today are still unable to see the natural world as part of the circle of life that deserves direct moral consideration quite apart from any real or imagined instrumental value to human civilization. Most leftists are for ecological goals such as preserving wilderness and biological diversity only to the extent that we can achieve such goals without negatively affecting the material standard of living of any group of human beings. The earth is always second, never first, in their thinking. This makes many leftists unreliable allies in ecological struggles. The simple fact is that what appears to be in the short-term interest of human beings as a whole, or a select group of human beings or of individual human beings, is sometimes detrimental to the short-term or long-term health of the biosphere, and often even to the actual long-term welfare of human beings. The left, to the extent that it refuses to push for human beings to adjust their way of life to be compatible with the planetary community of life, is part of the problem rather than part of the solution to the ecological crisis. This is perhaps clearest in most of the left's refusal to admit that there is a human population crisis and that we need to lower human population over the long run. The left puts down all issues of resource scarcity to maldistribution and the venality of multinational corporations. There is much truth in this, of course. There is an unconscionable maldistribution of wealth and the basic necessities of life among human beings that must be overcome. However, even if the problem of equitable distribution was solved, the existence of 5 billion, 7 billion, or 11 billion human beings converting the natural world into material goods and food puts the long-term sustainability of human society into question. Much of the left doesn't understand this simple ecological fact. Some do, of course. 
the Greens have made the sustainability of human society the cornerstone of their political vision. Yet, from my perspective, this isn't enough. For me, the problem is not just to figure out how to level off human population at a level that can be biologically sustained at equitable levels of consumption. I believe that the ecological community is not just valuable for what it can provide human beings. Other beings, both animal and plant, and even so-called inanimate objects such as rivers, mountains, and wilderness habitats are inherently valuable and live for their own sake, not just for the convenience of the human species. If we are serious, then, about creating an ecological society we will need to find humane ways to arrive at a global population level that is compatible with the flourishing of bears, tigers, elephants, rainforests, and other wilderness areas, as well as human beings. This will undoubtedly require us to lower our current population level which, even if we succeed at overcoming poverty and maldistribution, would probably continue to devastate the native diversity of the biosphere which has been evolving for three and a half billion years. I subscribe to the deep ecology principle that the flourishing of human life and cultures is compatible with a substantial decrease of the human population and that the flourishing of non-human life requires such a decrease. Note. R. Ness Ecology Community and Lifestyle 29. End note. The left is a long way from incorporating this principle into its thinking. Until that time, the left will be a mixed blessing for the ecology movement, offering both insight and delusions. I also see problems with much of the left's organizing style. Many radical activists are a dour holier-than-thou, humorless lot. They also seem too hyper-rational at times. Don't get me wrong. Rationality is a fine and useful tool, but it is just that, a tool, one way of analyzing matters. Equally important is intuitive, instinctive awareness. We can often become more cognizant of ultimate truth sitting quietly in the wild than by sitting in libraries reading books. Reading books, engaging in logical discourse compiling facts and figures are necessary and important, but they are not the only ways to comprehend the world and our lives. Furthermore, there is also that old story about how the left forms a firing squad. They stand in a circle and shoot inward. I think that it's unfortunate that instead of fighting the George Bushes and the Exxons, we so often find it easier to argue with people more down on our level and with whom we're more closely aligned. At its best, Earth First style offers a way forward that the left would be wise to learn from. We aren't rebelling against the system because we are sour on life. We're fighting for beauty for life, for joy. We kick up our heels in delight at a wilderness day, we smile at a flower, at a hummingbird. We laugh. We laugh at our opponents, and we laugh at ourselves. We are willing to let our actions set the finer points of our philosophy rather than debating endlessly about our program. We are willing to get started now, to make mistakes, to learn as we go. All in all, I think that what we need in the radical ecology movement is a healthier respect for diversity combined with the willingness to learn from all the different traditions that make up our movement. There is a basis for a common perspective big enough to house our various projects and emphases. I accept the fact that I've got a number of things to learn from the left. Yet, I also believe that the left has a few things to learn from me, Earth First, and the wider conservation movement. Let's learn from each other. Murray Bookchin Look, I was a leftist long before I was an ecologist. I was in the Young Communist League in 1934. I was part of the international communist conspiracy that used to scare Dave so much. And, I would add, not without some reason. Stalinism is a vicious ideology and Leninism is not much better. Like Dave, it was my personal concern with the terrible war that caused me to question my early political beliefs. The Vietnam War of my generation was the Spanish Civil War, or what I now prefer to call the Spanish Anarchist Revolution. We didn't know it at the time, the communists presented the Spanish Civil War merely as a heroic struggle between a liberal, left-leaning democracy and a fascist military corps but the reality of the situation, as I later found out, 
was that the effort by Spanish workers and peasants to answer Franco's military rebellion was perhaps the most widespread and profound anarchist revolution in history. Note. For a full discussion of the Spanish anarchist movement see, Murray Bookchin, The Spanish Anarchists, The Heroic Years, 1868-1936, New York, Harper Colophon, 1977, Sam Dalgoff, ed., The Anarchist Collectives, New York, Free Life Editions, 1974. End note. Few know this history even today. From 1936 to 1939, before Franco's ultimate victory, a system of workers' self-management was set up in numerous cities including Barcelona, Valencia, and Alcoy. Everywhere factories, utilities, transport facilities, even retail and wholesale enterprises, were taken over and administered by workers' committees and unions. The peasants of Andalusia, Aragon, and the Levant established communal systems of land tenure, in some cases abolishing the use of money for internal transactions, establishing free systems of production and distribution, and creating a decision-making procedure based on popular assemblies and direct, face-to-face -face democracy. While we did not know the full extent of this revolution at the time, I, among others, began to discover that the Spanish Communist Party under orders from Stalin, manipulatively used Soviet material support and sold out the Spanish people's struggle against the fascists because the communists feared the revolutionary anarchist movement, even more than a Franco victory. I won't weary you with the details, but many radicals of my generation saw, to our horror, that Stalinism was ultimately counter-revolutionary. For me, this meant becoming a Trotskyist for a short time. The Trotskyists were the only visible revolutionary left group in New York City that seemed to offer a serious challenge to Stalinism, at least as far I could see. Ultimately of course I became an anarchist. I began to see in anarchism a whole new philosophy and strategy for revolution. Where Marxist revolutionaries focused so much on the factory and sought to industrialize, and proletarianize peasants as a central part of their strategy anarchism followed a very different path. In Spain, for example it sought out the pre-capitalist communal traditions of the village, nourished what was living and vital in it, developed its revolutionary potentialities for mutual aid and self-management, and encouraged it to counter the blind obedience, the hierarchical mentality and the authoritarian outlook fostered by the industrial factory system. This line of thinking led me pretty quickly to a leftism much more in keeping with the North American revolutionary tradition. Think for a moment what would have happened in this country if the town meeting conception of democracy had been fostered as against the aristocratic proclivities for hierarchy, if political freedom had been given emphasis over laissez-faire economics, if individualism had become an ethical ideal instead of congealing into a sick proprietarian egotism, if the US Republic had been slowly reworked into a confederal democracy, if capital concentration had been inhibited by cooperatives and small worker-controlled enterprises, and if the middle classes had been joined to the working classes in a genuine people's movement such as the populists tried to achieve. If this North American version of an anarchist society had supplanted the Eurosocialist vision of a nationalized, planned, and centralized economy and state, it would be hard to predict the innovative direction the American left might have taken. It is this leftist, libertarian tradition that I urge the radical ecology movement to learn more about, to creatively draw inspiration from, and, of course to build on. I believe, however, that even this tradition is not a sufficient guide for green politics. We still have to develop a truly ecological perspective. Dave is right about this. I couldn't agree more with him in this respect. We can no longer speak meaningfully of a new or radical society without also tailoring our social relationships, institutions, and technology to the larger eco-communities in which our social communities are located. The most unbridgeable difference between social ecology and the traditional left is that the traditional left assumes, consciously or unconsciously, that the domination of nature is an objective, historical imperative. Following Marx, most leftists believe that the domination of man by man is, or at least was, a historically unavoidable evil that emerged directly out of the objective human need to dominate nature. 
liberals, social democrats, Marxists, and not a few classical anarchists adopted our modern civilization's dominant view of the natural world as blind, mute, cruel, competitive, and stingy. What disturbs me here is the very notion that humanity confronts a hostile otherness against which it must oppose its own powers of toil and guile before it can rise above the realm of necessity to a new realm of freedom. It is this view of nature that allowed Marx to write approvingly about capitalism as a progressive force in history. For Marx, capitalism was a progressive stage in history because it pushed human beings beyond the deification of nature and the self-sufficient satisfaction of existing needs which were confined within well-defined bounds. Capitalism, according to many people on the left today whether they consciously think about it or not, is the historical precondition for human liberation. Let us make no mistake about it, Marx, like most modern social theorists, believed that human freedom required that the natural world become simply an object for mankind, purely a matter of utility subdued to human requirements. Note. Karl Marx, Grundriss, New York, Random House 1973, 410. For a full discussion of Bookchin's critique of Marx's nature philosophy see Marxism as bourgeois sociology in Murray Bookchin, Toward an Ecological Society 195-210. End note. Given this ideological background, it should come as no surprise that most leftists who do take an interest in environmental issues do so for purely utilitarian reasons. Such leftists assume that our concern for nature rests solely on our self-interest, rather than on a feeling for the community of life of which we are part, albeit in a very unique and distinctive way. This is a crassly instrumental approach that reflects a serious derangement of our ethical sensibilities. Given such an argument, our ethical relationship with nature is neither better nor worse than the success with which we plunder the natural world without harming ourselves. I fundamentally reject this idea. Social ecology is a left libertarian perspective that does not subscribe to this pernicious notion. Social ecologists call instead for the creation of a genuinely ecological society and the development of an ecological sensibility that deeply respects the natural world and the creative thrust of natural evolution. We are not interested in undermining the natural world and evolution even if we could find workable or adequate synthetic or mechanical substitutes for existing life forms and ecological relationships. Social ecologists argue, based on considerable anthropological evidence, that the modern view of nature as a hostile stingy other grows historically out of a projection of warped, hierarchical social relations onto the rest of the natural world. Clearly in non-hierarchical, organic, tribal societies, nature is usually viewed as a fecund source of life and well-being. Indeed, it is seen as a community to which humanity belongs. This yields a very different environmental ethic than today's stratified and hierarchical societies. It explains why social ecologists continually stress the need to reharmonize social relationships as a fundamental part of resolving the ecological crisis in any deep, long-lasting way. It is an essential element in restoring a complementary ethical relationship with the non-human world. And let's be very clear about one thing. We are not simply talking about ending class exploitation, as most Marxists demand, as important as that is. We are talking about uprooting all forms of hierarchy and domination, in all spheres of social life. Of course the immediate source of the ecological crisis is capitalism, but, to this, social ecologists add a deeper problem at the heart of our civilization, the existence of hierarchies and of a hierarchical mentality or culture that preceded the emergence of economic classes and exploitation. The early radical feminists in the 1970s who first raised the issue of patriarchy clearly understood this. We have much to learn from feminism's and social ecology's anti-hierarchical perspective. We need to search into institutionalized systems of coercion, command, and obedience that exist today and which preceded the emergence of economic classes. Hierarchy is not necessarily economically motivated. We must look beyond economic forms of exploitation into cultural forms of domination that exist in the family between generations, sexes, racial and ethnic groups, in all institutions of political, economic and social management, 
and very significantly in the way we experience reality as a whole including nature and non-human life forms. I believe that the color of radicalism today is not red, but green. I can even understand, given the ecological illiteracy of so much of the conventional left, why many green activists describe themselves as neither left or right. Initially, I wanted to work with this slogan. I didn't know whether we were in front, as this slogan contends, but I at least wanted to move on to something new, something barely anticipated by the conventional left. Indeed, few have been as uncompromising in their criticism of the conventional socialist paradigm as I have been. However, as time has passed, I have come to see that it is very important that we consciously develop a left-green perspective. While the green movement is right to reject a mere variant of conventional left orthodoxy dressed up in a few new environmental metaphors, it is a huge mistake, I think, to fail to consciously draw on left libertarian and populist traditions, particularly eco-anarchism. When greens reject their affinity with these left traditions, they cut themselves off from an important source of insight, wisdom, and social experience. Today for example the US Green Movement cannot even bring itself to say with one voice that it is opposed to capitalism. Indeed, some locals of the US Green Committees of Correspondence are made up of moderate Republicans and liberal Democrats who talk of truly free markets, green capitalism, and green consumerism as a sufficient means for controlling the policies of multinational corporations. They talk about running workshops for corporate managers to encourage them to adopt an ecologically sound business ethics. A left libertarian green perspective cuts through this shallow, reformist, and very naive thinking. The radical left tradition is unequivocally anti-capitalist. A key lesson Greens can learn from a left libertarian ecological perspective is that corporate capitalism is inherently anti-ecological. Sooner or later, a market economy whose very law of life is structured around competition and accumulation, a system based on the dictum grow or die, must of necessity tear down the planet, all moral and cultural factors aside. This problem is systemic, not just ethical. Multinational, Corporate capitalism is a cancer in the biosphere, rapaciously undermining the work of eons of natural evolution and the basis for complex life forms on this planet. The ecology movement will get nowhere if it doesn't directly face this fact. To its credit, Earth First has done better than most ecology groups in understanding this point. Furthermore, I believe that the lack of a well-developed, Left libertarian green perspective has made too many people in the ecology and feminist movements vulnerable to a counter enlightenment mood that is increasingly gaining ground in Western culture generally. While the growing denigration of the enlightenment values of humanism, naturalism, reason, science, and technology is certainly understandable in light of how these human ideals have been warped by a cancerous patricentric, racist, capitalist, and bureaucratic society their uncritical rejection of the Enlightenment's valid achievements ultimately ends up by throwing out the baby with the bath water. That our society has warped the best Enlightenment ideals, reducing reason to a harsh industrial rationalism focused on efficiency rather than an ethically inspired intellectuality, that it uses science to quantify the world and divide thought against feeling, that it uses technology to exploit nature, including human nature, should not negate the value of the underlying Enlightenment ideals. We have much to learn from the solid organismic tradition in Western philosophy beginning with Heraclitus, and running through the near-evolutionary dialectic of Aristotle Diderot, and Hegel. We have much to learn from the profound eco-anarchistic analyses of Peter Kropotkin, and, yes, the radical economic insights of Karl Marx, the revolutionary humanist, anti-sexist views of Louise Michel and Emma Goldman, and the communitarian visions of Paul Goodman, E. A. Gutkind, and Louis Mumford. The new anti-enlightenment mood, which declares all these thinkers irrelevant or worse scares the hell out of me. It is potentially quite dangerous. Anti-rational, anti-humanist, supernatural, parochial, and atavistic moods are a frightening foundation on which to build a movement for a new society. Such perspectives can lead all too easily to the extremes of political fanaticism or a passive social quietism. They can easily become reactionary cold, and cruel. 
I saw this happen in the 1930s. That is why I say that eco-fascism is a real possibility within our movement today. That is why I have criticized several of the misanthropic statements that have been published in Earth First, why I have denounced those few Earth Firsters who stand around campfires and chant down with human beings, and why I have expressed dismay over the fact that extreme statements on AIDS, immigration and famine by some Earth Firsters went unchallenged for so long by deep ecology philosophers such as George Sessions, Bill Daval, and Arne Ness. I agree with Dave that we should respect diversity within our movement, but we should not mistake diversity for outright contradiction. Such views are, at best, unnecessary and, at worst, counterproductive to very dangerous. Is there really no role in our movement for a humanist ethics? Is there really no role for reason? Is there really no role for an ecologically sound technology that can meet basic material needs with a minimum of arduous toil? leaving people time and energy for direct democratic governance, an intimate social life, an appreciation of nature, and fulfilling cultural pursuits? Is there no role for natural science? Is there no role for an appreciation of a universal human interest? Is it really ecological to go around putting humanity down? Do we really have to replace naturalism with the new supernaturalisms that are now coming into vogue? Certainly Dave is right that a sense of wonder and the marvelous have a major place beside the rational human spirit. However, let us not permit a celebration of these ways of experiencing the world to degenerate, as happens all too frequently these days, into anti-rationalism. Let us not allow the celebration of nature as an end in itself to degenerate into a misanthropic anti-humanism. Let us not permit an appreciation of the spiritual traditions of tribal peoples to degenerate into a reactionary supernaturalist, anti-scientific, anti-technology perspective that calls for the complete unmaking of civilization and the valorization of hunting-slash-gathering societies as the only legitimate way of life. I appeal to all activists in the movement to stand up for naturalism and an expanded, ecological humanism. This is one of the most important lessons I've drawn from the left libertarian tradition out of which I come. If we are to create a free, ecological society we will need to learn this lesson and oppose the counter-enlightenment that has gripped far too many of our would-be allies. We need a resolute attempt to fully anchor ecological dislocations in social dislocations, to challenge the vested corporate and political interests we should properly call capitalism, to analyze, explore, and attack hierarchy as a reality not only as a sensibility, to recognize the material needs of the poor and of third world people, to function politically and not as a religious cult, to give the human species and the human mind their due in natural evolution, rather than regard them as cancers in the biosphere, to examine economies as well as souls, to develop a sound ecological ethic instead of getting sidetracked into scholastic arguments about the rights of pathogenic viruses. Indeed, unless the radical ecology movement integrates ecological concerns with the long-standing social concerns of the left libertarian tradition such as social ecologists have attempted to do, our movement will be co-opted, undermined, or turned into something dismal and oppressive. I am glad that Dave is now so willing to carefully pick through the litter of the centuries-long tradition of the radical left for useful insights and ideas. This is a worthwhile project, regardless of all the limitations and problems that are common on the left. My worry, however, is that Dave and other deep ecologist thinkers and activists will continue to eclectically borrow some of the specific programmatic proposals of the left libertarian tradition while ignoring or downplaying the underlying emancipatory, naturalistic, and humanistic logic of this tradition. Let's face it, specific proposals for decentralization, small-scale communities, local autonomy mutual aid, and communalism, which deep ecology philosophers such as Sessions and Deval have borrowed from eco-anarchists like Peter Kropotkin and myself, are not intrinsically ecological or emancipatory. Such an outcome depends ultimately on the social and philosophical context in which we place such programs. Few societies were more decentralized than European feudalism, which was structured around small-scale communities, mutual aid, and the communal use of land yet few societies were more hierarchical and oppressive. 
The manor eel economy of the Middle Ages placed a high premium on autarky or self-sufficiency and spirituality. Yet, oppression was often intolerable and the great mass of people who belonged to that society lived in utter subjugation to their betters in the nobility. A clear, creative, and reflective left-green perspective can help us avoid this fate. It can provide a coherent philosophical framework or context that can avoid the moral insensitivity racism, sexism, misanthropy authoritarianism, and social illiteracy that has sometimes surfaced within deep ecology circles. It can also provide a coherent alternative to the traditional left's neglect of ecology or its more recent, purely utilitarian commitment to reformist environmentalism. I am convinced that we will need to green the left and radicalize the greens if we are going to effectively defend the earth. That is why I think this dialogue is so important.